speaker is about to come up, which is uh, Damien and his Shalarif team. Um, they'll have a little bit more time each because there's only two of them. And um, we'll go from there. But the same format as, as earlier today. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everyone, for turning up today. Um, hopefully, there's some new interesting stuff for, for everyone. Um, yeah, so my name's Damien Thompson. I lead the Shallow Reefs sub-project and have led the overall project uh, since, I think, late 21. And so with the Shallow Reefs work, we've, we've largely um, conducted annual surveys, predominantly for coral and fish, but our focus is really trying to provide an improved understanding of um, key ecological processes. And that's in the shallow reef area, really sort of from the coast there out to about 15, 20 metres, just beyond where the boat's anchored. Um, all of the research outputs for the uh, entire program can be found here on the website. So that's all the publications, um, everything that we've done since 2015 is there. So if anyone's interested and also the data portal. So all of the shallow reefs data is available um, in QGIS format on, uh, on the data portal, which is accessible through that, through that link. Okay, so today I'm wrapped to be finally presenting something that's like hot off the press. Uh, this is in the final stages of review. review. Um, so for once in my life, I'm presenting something that's um, new and scientifically robust. Um, so this is, all the other stuff's just been like lots of arm waving and thinking, I wonder if I can get away with this. Um, yeah, and so this is some work we've done over sort of three to four years trying to refine our erosion measurements from uh, Ningaloo. In 2018, we were involved in a large um, collaboration which came out as a nature publication and that had some erosion estimates using our abundance data, but um, we were the first to recognise there was some, yeah, lots of, lots of problems with that data um, in terms of error and uh, lack of precision. So we've really worked on trying to improve that. Okay, so why is erosion important? Um, it's erosion, you know, a bit like trees falling in the forest. Um, it's critically important for basically the maintenance and persistence of coral reefs. At quite the small scale, as um, colonies die, um, they erode, it creates space for rejuvenation, settlement of new colonies and, and continued growth of the reef. Um, as we move up, in terms of uh, spatial scale, um, erosion also contributes to what we call reef complexity, so the unevenness of the reef. Um, and we know that that's positively correlated with things such as fish biomass and also diversity. And you can see even on this image here, all these dark grooves in the reef slope there, they're a, they're a function of erosional processes. So it's quite extensive. Um, at slightly larger scale again, so the erosional processes create sediments and rubble, um, which is really important for stabilising um, beaches, um, shorelines, and this photo here I think is Turquoise Bay. You know, a lot of that sand on the, uh, on the beach there would have been derived from uh, eroded coral and other things. And then finally, at the very largest scale, um, erosion is one side of the production erosion equation. So think of it as like a, you know, a balance. And uh, if reefs are to keep pace with things such as sea level rise, the rate of total erosion has to be less than the potential rate of growth for the reef. So with climate change, um, predicted sea level rise, the process of erosion is one that's receiving a fair bit more attention. Okay, so the three mechanisms of erosion commonly talked about uh, physical erosion. So this is largely due to the hydro hydrodynamic forces, so waves. Um, it's, it's positively correlated with the frequency intensity of storms. And basically the water movement abrades or dislodges parts of the reef and um, away it goes. Chemical um, erosion occurs through dissolution of the calcium carbonate material generally occurs slowly, um, but it also is positively related to things such as water movement. And then finally, biological erosion. So this is due to the activities of, of organisms, um, such as fish, such as the parrotfish here. And of the three forms of erosion, biological erosion is largely considered the most important, accounting for between 80 and 90% of all erosion um, on reefs in the Caribbean and Indo-Pacific. So for bioerosion can then be broken down into external versus internal bioerosion. So external erosion are generally due to things such as parrotfish, as pictured here, and urchins. Um, so as they 
feed on the surface of the reef and move across the surface of the reef, they effectively erode it due to mechanical um, and occasionally chemical processes. It accounts for about 90% of all bioerosion, uh, so it's quite important. Um, contrasting, you have internal erosion, so this is due to organisms that bore into the reef, um, and this can account for up to about 50% of all bioerosion. But there are challenges with measuring both of these types of erosion, um, and these largely stem around the fact that there's large variability, both spatial and temporal variability, in the erosional processes. Um, there's also uh, interactions between the processes. So, for example, it's been demonstrated that parrotfish um, can feed more on coral, which has a uh, large abundance of internal borers. So there's feedback mechanisms there that, that mean that the erosional um, processes are not linear. And finally, much of the erosion occurs beneath the reef surface, so it occurs within the reef. So it's really difficult to measure um, and quite expensive to measure. So the methods that are commonly used to measure erosion at the moment um, can be classified as either indirect or direct. So your indirect measurements, um, generally for things such as parrotfish and urchins, where you take a, an abundance estimate of the animal, so a density estimate, um, you multiply that by some activity metric, so something like feeding rate, um, to generally come up with an erosion rate, which we usually express as a rate, so it's kilograms of calcium carbonate per metre squared per year. Um, in contrast, uh, direct measurements usually involve the deployment of things such as experimental substrates. So this figure here is a little um, block of coral, one of ours that we deployed at Ningaloo. And so you scan that, put it out on the reef for a period of time, bring it back in, and then the change in volume on the external and internal surface of that um, coral block, remembering that coral's not solid, um, yeah, that gives you an estimate of the external and internal erosion. And again, that's expressed in kilograms per metre squared per year. Both of these methods have advantages and disadvantages, and they're actually quite complementary. Um, the indirect methods, they're great because you can take a traditional data set, so an abundance estimates of fish, for example, derived either through underwater visual census or camera observations. Multiply that by an activity measure and you'll get an erosion estimate. So they're commonly also scalable up to um, the scale of a reef, which is important because that's usually the scale that these um, systems are managed at. Um, but there is very large variability in these estimates. Uh, in comparison, the direct measurements, these tend to be very precise. Uh, they enable you to capture really small organisms, so the tiny worms. The image on the right there shows um, boring worms that are about one to two microns in diameter. Um, but the methods are really they're invasive, they're expensive, and they're really time consuming. And there's also a really big issue with scale, because you're taking measurements at well less than a millimetre and then effectively scaling that up in some cases to the uh, spatial scale of a reef. So the potential um, magnification of error is enormous. Okay, so despite the fact that the methods are quite complementary, most studies tend to use only one method. Um, that's usually because one of the methods tends to be better at addressing specific questions. Um, but what we wanted to do at Ningaloo is to try to provide a more integrated estimate of erosion. As mentioned, we're involved in that collaboration in 2018, um, but we recognise the limitations of a lot of those estimates that were incorporated into that nature paper. And so we set about um, setting up uh, 17 survey sites at North Ningaloo, um, 10 sites on the reef slope and seven uh, on in the lagoon area. And over three years, um, we deployed um, well, we conducted direct and indirect measurements of erosion. So the indirect um, estimates, they were taken, uh, used to get estimated erosion for parrotfish and urchins, and the direct estimates, um, we used these small coral blocks, as pictured here, um, so they were uh, deployed at all of the sites. Okay, so firstly with the parrotfish, um, yeah, over the three years we observed over a thousand parrotfish from six different species. Um, the parrotfish, 300 of them, divers basically jumped in the water. Um, this is an example of Chlororus microrhinus, one of the bigger parrotfish. And so after allowing the fish time to get used to the diver being there, the divers would swim, observe the number of bites, 
um, that the fish takes and then on separate occasions actually go and measure the size of those bites and the depths of those bites. So incredibly time consuming but essential to get in situ reliable estimates of erosion for the different species and also the different size fish. So this data was then used to come up with bite mass equations. So size specific bite mass, mass equations for each of the um, dominant parrotfish species at Ningaloo. Uh, so the figure here on the left, don't worry too much about it. I just wanted to show that, yeah, we had basically linear models for each of the species um, in terms of bites per minute, proportion of scars, bite area and bite mass. And this was used to, to get a much more accurate estimate of um, erosion for different size fish of the different species. Uh, for the urchins, uh, we used a fairly standard photo census technique um, using uh, photo transex. Uh, the number and type of urchin were censused uh, in the photos. This, this one here shows four echinometra, which was one of the two common species encountered. And we multiplied that by a known feeding rate, um, and that came from some earlier work done at Ningaloo. And for our direct measurements, uh, as mentioned, we use the coral blocks. So 50 blocks were put out on the reef um, in groups of three uh, and then retrieved either 12 or 20 months later. Uh, they were scanned using CT scans. Um, and the image in the middle there shows uh, a lagoon block on the left and a reef slope block on the right. Um, pre-deployment, so the top row is the pre-deployment scan, the one underneath is uh, post-deployment, so you can see the reef slope blocks have been absolutely hammered by parrotfish, and then underneath that, that's the calculated change in external volume, so the external erosion that's occurred during the deployment period, and then the internal erosion, you can actually pick up the, uh, effectively, the pixels that have been removed over the deployment period. So that's a really good way of getting an accurate estimate of erosion down to 35 microns, um, but some of the processes operate um, at levels smaller than that. And for that, we took a subset of blocks and we used scanning electron microscopy. And the images on the right here, there's a couple of um, uh, images from one of our blocks and those long thin lines, they're basically boring worms. Um, top one, I think that was they were one to two microns in diameter. One underneath, I think about 15 microns in diameter. So very, very small, but um, extensive throughout the blocks. Okay, so the results. So firstly, the direct estimates. So this is from the coral blocks. Uh, this figure just shows the erosion rate in kilograms per meter squared per year on the y-axis for the lagoon blocks on the left and the reef slope blocks on the right. So what we see firstly is that the erosion rate on the reef slope was about three times higher than what we observed uh, in the lagoon. And our macro borers, so they were our large internal borers, um, they were comparatively low um, compared to the erosion, the external erosion. Um, then when we add the indirect estimates, so this is the estimates for the urchins and the parrotfish, um, what we see here again is that the uh, erosion estimates for these group, this group was actually also higher on the reef slope than in the lagoon. Um, but parrotfish accounted for about 60% of all of the erosion, the direct erosion on the blocks. Um, in comparison to the urchins, which was between about 15 and 17 per cent. So the grazing parrotfish were um, certainly uh, more important in terms of overall erosion rates. And then possibly most importantly, um, this was our unaccounted erosion. So this was the erosion we couldn't account for on the blocks through either parrotfish erosion or um, urchin erosion. And this uh, constitutes about 35% of the erosion that we actually measured. So, you know, that's really important because obviously we're, you know, there's errors associated with our measurements. They're probably contributing to this unaccounted erosion. And also we're, you know, we're not necessarily capturing all of the erosional processes. So perhaps some of the physical erosion um, hasn't been captured and also chemical. Okay, so conclusions. Yeah, we had... Um, an overall erosion rate of just over three kilograms per metre squared per year. Um, that's just a number realised, but you know, it, it, putting it in context, that's fairly high um, globally. Uh, our reef slope uh, erosion rates were higher than our uh, lagoon. 
uh, largely due to the actions of parrotfish, in particular large individuals of that one species, Chlororus micorhinus. Our internal erosion rates were relatively low. Um, we think that's probably a combination of the short deployment period of the blocks. The internal erosion generally takes several years to get going. Um, and also we've got to remember that what we were measuring in the blocks, you know, the parrotfish are continuing to feed on the blocks all the time. So they're actually removing some of the um, internal eroders as they feed on the blocks. Um, and yeah, as mentioned, yeah, a significant part of the erosion measured on the blocks was unaccounted for using the indirect estimates. So what's next for us? Um, well, what we're doing is we're going back and revisiting the original erosion estimates in the um, nature paper and uh, improving those and then having a look at the other side of the equation as well, the production side. So we've taken some measurements um, of uh, coral production, CCA production, and we'll be trying to incorporate those into a, a broader carbonate um, model. Okay, so I just want to say a big thanks to everyone that's been involved in this work. Um, couldn't have done it without all of the uh, fantastic field assistants. Um, Nick Thake for his great imagery, um, the University of WA uh, scanning crew, they were very helpful with the CT and SEM guidance. Uh, Malcolm for kindly donating us uh, some Parides cores and the DBA staff as always for assisting with field logistics and also um, yeah, with a lot of this work. Okay, thanks very much. I'd like to uh, welcome Daff up to the stage, yes. Yeah, so. Daff's slides are way better than mine. Oh, oh yeah, it works. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Demo. Hello, everyone. I'm Daphne, and I'm the PhD student of the Lingaloo <laughs> Outlook Shallow Reef uh, Project, one of Damon's students. D only PhD student of Damien's. So <laughs> today I'll be sharing with you the first chapter of my PhD um, and what's been keeping up at night really. So <laughs> firstly, I like to tell this story because I grew up in Singapore and in a country where people actively avoid the beach, uh, I was made to take swimming lessons. So this is me <laughs> looking extremely unimpressed before my first uh, swim tests and I hated getting into the water okay and this is a question I get asked a lot as well do you need to know how to swim to be a marine biologist well much to the disappointment of baby Daphne here um, the answer has changed to no recently for me and here is why so in the marine environment tropical coral reefs they are widely recognized for their highly complex structures and that is often associated with their high biodiversity and also their productive ecosystem services. Now, hard corals, they form the structural foundation of coral reefs and the variety of shapes and sizes and the arrangement of these hard corals, they create the intricate structure and that provides essential habitats for uh, thousands of reef-associated species. So a uh, very healthy coral reef like this, this was taken in Ningaloo, uh, they typically have what we call high structural complexity and that is often associated positively with the abundance and distribution of fish communities. In recent decades, however, natural and human-induced disturbances have substantially degraded coral reefs around the world and the loss in structural complexity has then uh, resulted in habitat loss for a lot of these species that are highly dependent on coral reefs. Yet, we still have limited knowledge on how structural complexity actually influences or mediates critical uh, processes like providing shelter for fish. So traditionally, structural complexity was assessed using simple measures like life coral cover, coral abundance and the very popular linear rigosity. However, it has since been argued that these measures don't account for ecologically important measures like shelter. In recent times, technology has allowed for photogrammetry, 
which is gaining popularity in recreating this 3D representation of reef areas. And this method has since allowed for finer 3D assessment of structure. But to make empirical research that much more difficult on corals, um, they have a very long lifespan and also very slow growth rates. So to really understand the changes in reef communities, we need to have years and years of observations. Now, even then, we can constantly create new ways to measure structural complexity. We still don't quite know what are the metrics fish are responding to. For example, we don't know how sheltered those fish are from predators that are crawling around on the seafloor, for instance. Or we still can't really measure how sheltered fish are from a predator that's swimming around in the water column. So that got me thinking, how can I measure shelter without smashing any corals to measure holes and crevices? Is there a way I can look at how different coral communities influence metrics over time without having to do a PhD for 10 years? Are there any correlations between metrics that are easy to measure and those that are ecologically more meaningful but labor intensive and also cost a lot more? And so I used Coral Craft, which is a simulation model uh, to look at how coral communities of different um, diversity levels influence structure complexity and shelter over time. So in our model, we uh, created corals based on the 10 most common growth forms in the world. This is, this, these are what they are. And they have scientific names. Will I remember them? Probably not. I never will, to be honest. So I refer to them as how they look, also known as their morphologies. And this is how they look like in Coral Craft. And we did this all in R. We created this in R. Not me, my supervisor, Michael Renton. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> apart from creating pretty simulations like these, we also used the model to measure uh, various metrics uh, that we think might be meaningful to assess structural complexity and shelter. Now, there are six on here, but there are seven in total that we looked at, and I'll be giving you a brief description of them and how we calculated them. So, the first one is linear rugosity, which is a pretty standard structural complexity metric used in core research. And we calculate that by taking the distance of the chain, which follows the contours of a reef, to a fixed linear distance. And that's how we do it in Karakra. Same thing. Now, linear rugosity is probably, I would say, the pioneer of all structural complexity metric. Unfortunately, it still fails to capture those spaces in pink, which we think are the important 3D spaces fish might respond to. Moving on, surface rugosity is also very popular and that is commonly used in photogrammetry as well. Um, and we calculate it by comparing the surface area of all the corals within coral craft to the area of a flat sea floor. And what that means is we put a blanket over it, you take the area of this blanket over the area of the flat sea floor in coral craft. Now, while this metric might be more accurate than linear rugosity, we think or is actually not representing shelter, which is still what we are interested in. So we figure out, so we move on to the next metric, which is fractal dimension. It's very, very popular in photogrammetry for some reason. In my opinion, it's so hard to understand ecologically. I'm gonna try my best to describe it to you, but I'm not taking questions on fractal dimensions. <laughs> okay, so what I think it means is that it captures how fragmented surfaces are, and the surface of a structure is represented in light green. And it also captures how these fragmented surfaces fill up a 3D space, which is coral craft, the environment in coral craft. And it translates into the amount of microhabitat a structure might produce. And that's in blue or red. So I had then also developed some metric uh, to quantify shelter within coral craft. 
and we think that these metrics are those that are currently lacking in empirical research. So the first one is shelter volume. We calculated the volume under the corals because um, they sort of represent shelter. And then since restructure play a very important role in shaping predator-prey interactions as well, we developed two new metrics to measure shelter from predators. So the mass of shelter here is uh, measuring how sheltered a fish is within coral craft um, from a bottom dwelling predators or from bottom dwelling predators, also known as demersal predator, hence demersal shelter. And then we also measured pelagic shelter, so how sheltered a fish is from a pelagic shelter that's swimming around in the water column. Lastly, predator-prey interactions are inherently influenced by size. So predator risk increases when the body size of a prey become, is smaller. So we also want to capture that and we calculate it by measuring the amount of space a small prey fish can fit in, but a larger size uh, fish cannot. So with the seven metrics in mind, we ran 13 scenarios of different coral community types. The results are very, very overwhelming. It took me ages to try and figure out what they actually mean. And to keep you all listening intensely, I'm going to pick three extreme community types and hopefully highlight the results for today. And they are the communities with all 10 coral types. So we named that uh, maximum diversity. And then we also just looked at or we will only be looking at monospecific communities, so only the one type with the very complex branching corals and the very sort of simple uh, tabular corals. So this plot shows linear rigosity on the y-axis and the amount of years we run the model for on the x-axis. Uh, as you can see, over time, all three community types increased uh, in linear rigosity from um, after five years, with branching corals displaying the highest values and tabular corals displaying the lowest. This is exactly how we predicted the result for linear rigosity to be, which tells me that the model works. Which, I mean, it should, because Anna and Michael Renton created it, so... <laughs> Now, comparing linear rigosity and fractal dimension, while this new 3D metric also increased over time to slight like linear rigosity, there are some differences in the patterns where the direct opposite occurs. So tabular communities are shown to have uh, more structure than branching communities, which is, uh, which is very interesting. So when we look at this new shelter metric as well, so shelter volume de depicted here. The tabular communities, ones, the ones with simple structures, has a much higher shelter volume than communities with maximum diversity and for a little while communities with branching corals as well. Comparing this to shelter metric though, you can see that shelter reduces greatly in tabular communities which makes sense if you think about how easily that eel can reach a prey underneath all those corals or tabular corals as opposed to the community with only branching corals. Now, so far, I've only showed you a little bit of my result, but these results are already, already telling me that different coral community types seem to influence the metrics differently over, over, over the years, over the time that we ran the model for. So I can keep going, but another thing that we were also really interested in was whether the metrics are correlated with each other or not. And to find out whether they are correlated is valuable because some metrics are a lot easier to measure in the field, like linear rigosity, as opposed to doing a whole photogrammetry thing for the other stuff. So after doing a correlation analysis, Interestingly, in the diverse communities where there are more than one coral type, we found that structural complexity metrics correlated strongly with each other. And also these three metrics correlated really strongly with demersal shelter and size dependent shelter. 
shelter volume and pelagic shelter on the other hand, they were only strong, strongly correlated with each other and not to the other metric, which is very cool. And then we also looked at these different metrics and their results only in the monospecific community, so the communities with only one type of coral. There are more than just the two of them, so we ran also 10 other different types of monospecific communities, so this is the result for all of them. And we found that not only are the structural complexity metric correlated strongly with each other, but all of these are also strongly correlated with all of those metrics. So I think the main takeaway, there's lots to digest, but the main takeaway from our study is that different metrics, they do give different conclusions about structural complexity and shelter, and that the greater diversity of coral doesn't necessarily mean there's greater structural complexity and shelter, which means the commonly assumed relationship between diversity, uh, structural complexity and shelter is not true for all types of coral communities. And lastly, our study suggests that it is important to consider more than one metric and also the coral community type when we're trying to understand the impact of structural complexity and the um, influence on fish communities as well. So this chapter has made a nice segue for me to look at these metrics in real life. So we've been out into the field collecting metrics within this one by one quadrant that uh, I made and also whether those metrics can also be collected using photogrammetry as well. So it's like a nice comparison. Stay tuned. There might be another talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the moral of the story is no, you don't need to be to know how to swim, to be a marine biologist, but also yes, because it's quite fun. That's me almost missing the mentor ray at the back. Damo <laughs> was like swimming frantically after me to make sure I look up from that quadrat, <laughs> which means I was hard at work. So lastly, I want to thank Cyro and Woodside for giving me this amazing opportunity and for funding my project. I would like to show some appreciation Say thank you to my supervisors for their support. So Anna, Michael, and Demo, in case you've forgotten how he looks like. Um, and then to all the Syro people here in Quali for tolerating my whining when the computer breaks down. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>